Hello everybody, I'm so excited to spend some time with you. I want you to come in and I want to share some things with you. It is 6.59 my time. Hello everybody, hello, hello. God bless all of you. Um, hello to everybody. Hi, Ty and Talent, will you contact Elder Ivy and tell her I said put you on my uh, calendar immediately, please? Um, hello, Matt with the sax, how you doing? Tierra, I saw you in here, creatively, Jay, hey, hey. Norris, hey, I miss you, man. Uh, Captain Andrew, hello. King's Kid, hello from Woodbridge, Virginia. Uh, Jasmine, okay, which one? Uh, Dantastic. I know that picture anywhere. Put me on that calendar. Hey, Apostle Vaughn, you can get on there whenever you want. Whenever you want. Hey, Apostle Yolanda, I'm so excited to see you in, in, in a, what, a couple of hours? Pastor Hutchinson, God bless you. Liberty in the house, all right? Um, hello from everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, John, John. Hey, man, Sarah, how are you? I hope you're taking care of Ryan and vice versa. Uh, it is time to pray. It is time to pray. I'm supposed to see you soon. Okay, good. I'll see you then. All right. Uh, first of all, let me say hello and um, thank God for all of you and, and for all of you that are here today. I have received, normally, I get a bunch of emails from people my admin forwards me stuff from people saying how much I've ticked them off and um, made them mad and offended their pastors and all of the stuff you know I do. Uh, but today was a little different. I got a bunch of very encouraging stuff from people I don't really know and um, from people I'd never seen before. And it really blessed me uh, to know what my words are being used by God to do and um how my simple thoughts or what I think are simple thoughts are, are blessing people and important. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, I want to, and every time I get, I'd, I'd like to thank you guys for following, following me on Periscope and for being a part of my discussions, my rants, my revelations, etc. Tonight I want to give you some time and I want to share some things with you. And um, I hope that the connection is clear because tonight is a very important periscope. This is a very important periscope. And somebody say and rebukes. Uh, a very important periscope. And I think this affects you. This affects you. Thank you so much, everybody, for your kind words. It means the world to me. Um, but this is going to be a very important periscope. And I... Um, I am in the in the beginning portions. I think it's the beginning of a massive uh, paradigm shift with one of the value systems of our church, and uh, it has always been a value system of our church. We were doing it before we know we should be doing it, and then we were doing it before we had a language for why we did it, and then we were doing it before we even had a full, complete uh, revelation for why we did it. But um, I am undergoing a renovation and something is being added to our church that I think is important to the heart of God and something, quite frankly, that is largely missing from the majority of people in the kingdom. So go ahead and share this. Uh, here's my preface is that this will be controversial. It will be controversial, but you know, nothing like a little piece of uh, kingdom controversy to get your day started uh, or your evening started in the right way. All right, I entitled this scope, The Incomplete Gospel, The Incomplete Gospel. Um, I want to address something that is missing from, yeah, this is going to be better than patty pies. This, I, I want to address something that is missing from um, our presentation of the scriptures and our presentation of the gospel and our presentation from... Uh, our Christianity, our walk. And um, I want to share something with you that I think is to blame behind Hutchinson. You have a bad habit of doing that. Stop. You always come up with my stuff before I'm ready to introduce it. Let me paint my picture. <laughs> uh, probably to blame for less than quality Christians, uh, endurance and walk with God and walks with God and intimacy with God. Uh, but also, um, what I'm about to talk to you about is um, probably to blame for why most Christians see salvation as the highest uh, point of God. Like all God wants out of your life is to save you 
from sin and the fires of hell. It's kind of the subconscious way we present the gospel is that, you know, the good news is you don't have to die and go to uh, hell. You can go to heaven and that's good. But up until the time you die, you just kind of roam earth and stay away from sin. Um, and then it is appointed uh, unto man wants to die. And then you go to heaven. And then you kick it with Mahalia. But uh, needless to say, our gospel has been fractured. And our gospel has been fractured by culture. It has been fractured by doctrine. It has been fractured by the traditions of men. It has been fractured uh, for a number of reasons. But one of the things that I believe that the Holy Ghost is breathing on in this moment is this. Um, the presentation of the gospel is incomplete uh, if it is missing effective follow-up. The presentation of the gospel is incomplete if it is missing effective follow-up. We serve the God of the follow-up. And not just follow-up, but of continual follow-up. And the way that follow-up ends up looking, or what you know this follow-up to be, is discipleship. Our problem with how we present the gospel is basically what we do is we preach a message, we give an ultimatum, we get the fear of the Lord in people, or the fear of hell, or the fear of the devil, or whichever works the quickest, and then we make them walk the plank. They come, they join a church. Uh, they, with with good intent, surrender their hearts to the Lord and decide, hey, I want to give my life to God, right? And we, being noteworthy Christians, take them in, shake their hands. We proudly boast that they have been added to the number. And then comes Monday. And then comes Tuesday. And then comes Wednesday. And then comes Thursday. And the very same forces that they departed on the prior Sunday have now amped up their battle strategy and amped up their aggression towards this particular person to ensure that their decision does not remain intact. Question, was the decision real? In old school, old school church, they would say no. But I find that the decision is real. It's just that that decision has got to be reinforced with this D word. And it's not damned because that's the one us Pentecostals love to use. You know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I am referring to the other D word in Matthew 28. When Jesus told them to go into all nations, teaching them and making disciples. So the primary reason why this is missing largely from the, the New Testament church model that you and I have probably been grown in and the New Testament model that we present is that we read that scripture in Matthew 28 as if it said, go to all nations and create converts and make people raise their hand in healing crusades because they made a profession of faith. Or sign their name on a card and make sure that you've got their name on the roster. I don't even know where the roster is located. But uh, let's keep their names there for accurate accounting purposes. But if there be no follow-up, there is an open door now where the seed of the word of God. Because remember, according to the parable of the sower, when you're dealing with it from Jesus' mind at least, Jesus says, uh, a sower went to sow. And when the sower sowed the seed... Some fell to the wayside, some sell, fell on thorny ground, and it gave three different examples of the different types of soil that the seed would be sown on. Jesus gives us further insight in letting us know that the sower sows the word. So contrary to popular belief, if you are on the other side of yes, and if you are on the other side of Christianity, you think that the presentation of the word hits people, unbelievers, backsliders, etc. It hits people in a full-blown, full-fledged, fruitful way. And unfortunately, that is an inaccurate understanding of how the Word of God hits them. The Word of God hits them in the form of a seed. 
And unfortunately, by the time Tuesday gets here, addiction get back, iniquity is activated by your decision towards salvation, and all of the other things that don't want you to come into the kingdom of light, that seed now has been easily devoured but by what Jesus called the birds of the air, the fowls of the air, and that seed does not take root. Challenge. The seed may not take root, even though the body, the clothes, and the talent continues in the local church. And so what happens is you end up with people who do exterior renovations. They learn church culture. They learn Christianese. They learn how to make it, and they learn how to present uh, themselves and, and then if they have a talent they ultimately learn how to brand themselves all of that stuff and they have a lingering issue in their heart which is at the beginning of their walk nothing took root and Jesus gives us discipleship relationship between an authority figure and and people that they're pouring into spiritual fathers and mothers teachers, whatever, to ground you in the decision you just made. I believe we have presented the gospel in an extremely incomplete fashion when we tossed the seed of the word of God, told them to be born again, and then alluded to the fact that once you get born again, you are mature enough to now handle warfare, war moves, Something that I'm going to do a whole periscope on later is the, the retaliation. Every decision against darkness triggers certain forces that have been waiting for the legal right to come after you. And uh, we don't teach people how to deal with and how to counteract the forces that are come to that are going to come up them to make sure that the seed of the word never takes root. And so, um, yeah. The challenge is the gospel, the decision towards deliverance, the decision towards salvation does not take root without discipleship. Now, a lot of people make it. They luck up and grow. Maybe they hear a word. Maybe they go into a good church. Maybe they get hands laid on them or some type of unplanned or unforeseen phenomena that makes up the disparity between how they came into the kingdom as an infant and them being able to grow Okay, but unfortunately, the majority are not so lucky. I was telling one of my sons in the Lord yesterday, I, I told him, you know, you're really ungrateful. And I was explaining to him that as a man of God called into ministry, he was fortunate to be in an environment and under leaders that could raise him up because 90% of the other ones have to grow up. Most Christians, most believers, most preachers, most whatever in the kingdom have to grow up because they are not privileged enough to be in a context where they can be raised up. The difference is the energy that is deliberately directed to the area of your life, your passion, your calling, your healing, your deliverance, your restoration, etc. So discipleship is why the gospel is incomplete. It's because the people of God are clueless about the power of a follow-up. And if you read the New Testament epistles, all of what they did and a lot of what they wrote about were follow-up. You know, it was hardly ever dealing with or addressing anything present-based. Peter, Paul, all of them addressed their churches, all of them addressed their disciples through the letters that you and I now benefit from as the New Testament, but accurately in their context, they were follow-up letters, they were treaties that the apostles wrote to make sure that they instructed their disciples on the accurate way to care for churches and Christians after a decision had been made because the decision is not enough. Some people say all you need is a made up mind and that's just a churchy way of letting you know that we don't know what else to do with you past you making the decision and walking the plank down the, the middle aisle. But most of you out there watching me have made several decisions before that you changed your mind of from. 
that you were not strong enough to endure with, uh, that you end up having coming under attack with the right amount of external or relational pressure, fear, got a hold, whatever. Decisions have got to be reinforced by something more superior than it to make sure that when the decision comes under attack, you have enough in you to remain confident and grounded in that decision. And so discipleship is the science of the kingdom that helps people to not just reinforce decisions, but to escort them into deliverance and therefore release them into destiny. I think the way we approach destiny is the reverse. We pursue destiny and then end up having to be delivered because we realize in our pursuit of destiny how unready we are by end up going through sin cycles and bondages and emotional challenges and, and, and all of that. But I believe it's really God's idea that you be make, taken from a decision, from decision to deliverance, and from deliverance to destiny. Most people, especially in the Pentecostal apostolic charismatic tradition, go from a decision to destiny if you're lucky, and the deliverance process is pursued after destiny. And while you're experimenting on God's people, you're trying to manage your own issues, and you spend the remainder of your life trying to stay away from hell through the skin of your teeth. The missing piece is discipleship. I believe small group discipleship, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, corporate discipleship, it's a missing piece. Uh, it, it is so grievous, I think, to the heart of God. Now, this is something our church started this way. And, and to be very honest, I don't even know why. Uh, because I had to be, I didn't have a revelation of it. Uh, it was just something we ended up doing, probably because we had no real team, and so I had to look around me to see who was available and create a team because I couldn't draw one otherwise. Nobody believed that we were going to do what we were going to do. Nobody uh, 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 agreed. Everybody felt as if uh, uh, it was too extreme and unnecessary and Chicago would reject it. So because I could not find a team elsewhere, I started looking around to who was around me and I started doing dinner. I started doing long nights on couches. I started calling Saturday morning breakfasts where we would talk about the gifts of the spirit, talk about deliverance, iniquity, generational curses. And uh, I didn't know that that was what I was doing. I thought I'm just building a team because I can't hire one. And um, unfortunately, whew, it was the long route. Uh, I grieved for a while that my church was not 6,000 members in two years. But now on, on the 12th year anniversary of it, I praise God that God took me the long route because what I ended up with was real sons and not hirelings or people that just wanted to be a part of the next exciting thing and therefore the longevity of my investment in them could not be raped or could not be swallowed up by somebody else competing for it or using a, 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 a position to, to sway them. So I praise the Lord that God now, that God took me the long route, but it was not always easy. To be very honest, it depressed me for years because I knew the mandate that was on my life. I knew the mandate that was upon my house. I knew the effectiveness on it. I knew the oil that was on it. But for whatever reason, God made a decision to take his time with me. And a part of why God made and is making the decision to take his time with me is because God has convicted me deeply about building people and that people are more important than paperwork and people are more important than properties. People are more important than programs. God has put that as a, a value system in who that I am, how I am. And so because it's how I am and that's how I've always been, that thing has infiltrated itself through my church and through the elders. And we're not perfect by any means, but it is something that I feel like God is gripping us tighter about uh, is, is, is our handling of people and his investment in them and what he wants. As a secondary consequence of understanding discipleship, we flowed powerfully in deliverance because the strength of discipleship is not just notes and academics and catechism. The strength of, di of discipleship is also deliverance. You see, when you bring people into small groups regularly, 
and you bring them into intimate quarters, coffee shops, restaurants, living rooms, whatever, you end up getting a more clear perspective of what their battles are, what their fears are, what their paranoias are. You get a greater sensing from the iniquitous pattern that is active in them. This is why one of the, the value systems of our church is teams is because you, if you're going to get people free, you've got to put them in the context of a team because teams reveal people. All of the strongest problem people in my church, number one, because we are a house of war, problematic people never really last. They either get delivered or they leave. But every problematic person in my church resisted being added to a team. When people resist being brought into a team context, it's mainly because there is a force in them that is working overtime to not be seen. And so we had a value for teams before we had a revelation of it. We grew in the revelation of teams later. And so earlier on when we would bring people in small group context and we would begin to talk about freedom and we would begin to talk about holiness and we would begin to talk about righteousness, all of a sudden through the teaching certain things would be triggered. Father wounds would be triggered. Mother wounds would be triggered. Uh, hurt by church would be triggered. Uh, wrong perspectives of self would be triggered. A lot of forces would be triggered. And when those forces in our tradition, in our context, would be triggered, we were baptized in the spirit of war. So we knew to walk through deliverance. And some of them were for hours. It was the foundation stone of our church. And uh, up until now, I probably would have said that deliverance was the, the beginning and prophecy were the beginning foundations of our church. But what I'm realizing, it was really God programming us in a very profound kingdom conviction and kingdom ethic for discipleship and disciple making. One of the reasons why the contemporary church refuses to do, do it is because converts can be called. Is there one? Is there one? Okay, you go from Muslim to Christian, from seven-day adventurer to Christian, from, I mean, I'm sorry, Adventist to Christian, from Jehovah's Witness to Christian. You come, is there one? I'm making a call, a call, the call to the altar, the opening of the doors of the church. But the Bible says in Matthew 28 that disciples must be made. And unfortunately, the church is not really interested in anything they have to make, so they rent they buy, they lease, they pawn, they prostitute, they steal, they hijack. And so I think that God is really trying to put something on us that's going to give us the power, the passion, and the prophetic eye to see discipleship as something that is important to God. For example, many pastors are stressed right now. Uh, not just because they're not seeing new converts and their churches are not growing and because they're lacking finances or whatever the, the particular thing may be. But many pastors are frustrated right now uh, because of the absence of help. I need an executive pastor. I need a... a, a uh, a, uh, a youth pastor. I need a female pastor. I need it. And, and the reason why they are in need of so many of these skill sets is because they are not able to see the skill sets that are in the people that are there. You see, in my experience, whenever I have needed a skill set and I have needed a position field, God would send me a person with a problem. Now, the numbers are low because discipleship is not something people want to talk about. And it, believe it or not, it's not something people are interested in and don't think that they need. But in my experience, every time I have needed a position field, he has sent me a person with the problem. And when that person with the problem came... After a season of deliverance, I found the treasure that was in the earthen vessel. So to date, I have yet to put an ad out or went to anybody's church to contract anything. I don't need to. 
I never intend to need to because God, the mantle upon our house has a, a, a power to, to magnetize people from across the states to come and be what they need to be. And when we committed to people, God started giving us properties. God started giving us buildings. God started giving us all that we needed for provision. So we made people a priority. And then, of course, because of the dominant anointing on my life, through, through deliverance, we started to prophesy. And we prophesied and we prophesied and we prophesied. And we held prophetic gatherings and we built prophetic teams. And people mocked it and said, it's too much. And you're doing too much. You're deep. You should be praising. And you guys, pro but I want you to find out the risk in ministering deliverance and not prophesying. You say, if you take people through a deliverance process and you don't have the prophetic anointing in your midst, you won't be able to see why God is so aggressive about setting people free. God does not want people free for freedom's sake. There is something that is inside every one of these people, uh, a calling, a mandate, a purpose, a reason. There's, there's a reason why they exist. And what deliverance does is deal with the curses, the iniquity, the tendencies, the issues, the problems, the proclivities, the, the things that they are intuitively inclined to that's contrary to their destiny. But what the prophetic does is provide you with resource to see not just what God put there, but what the devil is after. That then gives you power for deliverance because now you know what you're protecting. Now you know what you're preserving. Now you know what you're bringing out from the invisible to the visible in this person. If a person has potential, it's got to be perceived prophetically. You can't just take a quiz and a test and, 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 and use your talent. It has got to be perceived prophetically. And so at the end of the day, deliverance. Deliverance ought to automatically be prophetic and so should discipleship because you are literally basing teachings, counsel, instructions, life on life examples to people based upon what God put in them. So that's another reason why that's important to God. Another reason this is important to God is this. I think that it is past time. If you want to hear something from me, one of my grievances, particularly with the contemporary church and church planters, is that we really believe that our method of ministry is more efficient than Jesus's. There are so many culturally seduced and deluded church models out there and groups and franchises and brands that really believe that they are smarter than Jesus, who the Bible says is the head of the church, right? And so if you resolve that Jesus's pattern is literally enough and is literally sufficient, then you would not try to improve on the methodology of Jesus. And I have committed in my church model to do the method of Jesus, irrespective of my particular background and my particular liking and my particular leaning and all of that stuff, right? And so, so this, whoever this is, 5063, that keeps coming on here trying to distract me. This is the reason why you're divorced and lonely. I want you to stay off of here if this is offending you and go and see your counselor because they're looking for you. Anyway, um, the method and the model of Jesus. Now, Jesus' method and Jesus' model is this. When Jesus Christ came on the scene immediately after he got ready or, or immediately after he presented his, 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 God, his message, he, he read them. The Bible says that his first message, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He had anointed me to preach the gospel. And then he told them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing, right? So he aligned them with what rested on his life. After he aligned them with what rested on his life, then he said this, you know, he let them know I am the one that this would, that Isaiah was talking about. He left from them. And then his first strategy was not branding. His first strategy was not investment groups. 
His first strategy was not even miracles. Do you know what the first strategy of Jesus was? Not necessarily his first action, but his first strategy was to pull 12 underdeveloped, undecided, unrefined men on himself in his space, in his arena. Now, we are in a season and we are in a generation of a lot of really wounded leaders, wounded, and they are anointed, they are gifted, they are even legitimately called, but because many of them have not had the power of discipleship and impartation or fathering or whatever you're going to call it in their world, they fear bringing people on them because they don't want people to become common with who they are. And I understand the dilemma. You know, there's a fine line between relating to a leader and relating to a teacher and then subconsciously disrespecting what rests on their lives. So I get the risk involved. But if you're going to be a real leader Jesus way, you have got to be willing to pull somebody on your life. It can't be everybody. It probably won't even be the majority. But if Jesus did 12 and you're supposed to do great, okay, here we go. And, and we're supposed to do greater works, then what ends up happening is we need to have more people on us in cycles than the man Jesus did. Jesus' strategy was this. I'll be here 33 years, right? 30th birthday, I'll go ahead and start a ministry. I'll devote myself to 12 men for three years, and then I'll go ahead and I'll die. And then Jesus says, upon this rock to his disciples, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says that, lets them know I've got intentions on building a church, and then what does he do? He leaves. He dies. He has the nerve to die. How then did he build his church? Through his students and through his disciples. So he built a team. The team built the church. And you and I are still here as a byproduct of what those 12 men did. They did that on the energy base, on the teachings, on the strength of three years, night and day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner that they spent with a quality discipler. And so we've got to really look at Jesus' strategy and wonder why so many pastors are committed to staying away from making legitimate disciples, raising people up, raising sons, pouring their tears into people, pouring their time into people. It's, it's, it's almost like you have to wipe those scriptures and those examples out. If you don't understand discipleship, you don't even understand the gospels. If you don't understand the concept of discipleship, then you have misread Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because the context of the synoptic gospels is a reveal, is an expose, is a demonstration of what Jesus was doing while he was raising disciples. So if you examine the gospels through the context of discipleship, you start to see it in a much more profound way because when we read the scriptures, we think that Jesus wrote a letter to us. Now I get it. It is very much so applicable to us and it is useful to us and it is profitable to us and all scriptures God breathe. But context Actually, what are we doing? We are reading the Gospels and we are examining what Jesus did with his 12 disciples. And so I am so burdened because this is a New Testament pattern. It is an apostolic pattern. It is a, a revival pattern. It is a present truth pattern. And yet it is under attack in most churches around the world. And I get that the leader can't do it, the senior leader can't do it, but the elders should have disciples. The ministry gifts should have disciples. I believe the delivered should have disciples. Now, and, and I think that everybody needs some form of discipleship resource. I mean, the fact that people who are pastors still believe that it is okay to lead people and not be led or not be a part of a broader context and not have a bishop or not have an apostle or not have an overseer, to me, proves the idiocy and the lunacy and the absolute spirit of insanity that governs the majority of Americans, America's leaders.
They really do believe that they are exempt from the stuff that they mandate that you do. And somehow they think that after they've reached their 50th or their 55th birthday, then it makes them a general in the spirit. And of course, if I'm a general, I don't have to report anybody because I've got so much behind me that I've known everything I need to know. Decorated in religious crap, it's still a lack of accountability and should be treated as criminal and should be treated as a lack of integrity and should be questioned by those that follow them. If you are worth following, you should be following. I could never see myself wholeheartedly committed to an organization if I did not know and was not certain that the leader or the head of the house was regularly open to and regularly submitted to and regularly committed to asking wisdom, posturing themselves. I believe it, it gets a greater, greater respect when as a senior pastor or a senior leader, your following sees you submitted in the posture of recipient and, and, and sonship and not just the head poobah in charge. And for many of the leaders that do that, it's the reason why they've got scrupulous behavior and children out of wedlock and cheating on their taxes and cheating on their wives and hiring their mistresses and stealing the offerings and all kind of stuff. It's because nobody more senior than them is thinking to ask the necessary questions and being hard on what they're doing in absence of discipleship. And so it is the missing part of the gospel. What makes the gospel mature in the work of a person and mature in the heart of of a person and work in the heart of a person is the fact that they have got to come into the kingdom and learn the new normal. Discipleship presents the new normal. You have a normal in darkness, a normal behavior, a normal affinity, a normal philosophy a normal context, a normal craving. You've got a normal philosophy. You've got a normal constitution, a set of rules, a set of protocols that you abide by. And as you abide by them, sin, the Bible calls it in Romans 8, it calls it the war and the law in the members. So your members have a law in them. That law is ingrained in them by years of reckless behavior and by years of submission submission to the flesh and submission to hell and submission to sin. You making a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life is not enough to confront, to undo, to unravel, to unseat those laws, those codes, those tendencies from your members, from your thinking, from your desires, from your appetites. And so I want you to think about why, if we say that we are born again, why you assume that you come into the kingdom as an adult, spiritually speaking, or as a full mature person, spiritually speaking. If you get born again at 40, then it just mean, it, it means that when you come into the kingdom, you are a baby and you must be nurtured and you've got to grow and you should be on the heels of somebody who can teach you the new normal. So what happens? We come in the kingdom that's governed by a different set of agents, a different set of rules, a different protocol, and a different constitution altogether. And we decorate and we camouflage and we put armor on the un confronted, untransformed normals and we backslide and we remain backslidden and we are not conformed, the Bible says, from the image of darkness to the likeness of his dear son because the instrumentation of conformity to us is that God puts us in learning communities, in relationships, in attachments that transform us to look like the man Jesus Christ. And so... God is, uh, this has always been a part of my um, um, ministry philosophy, has always been a part. I mean, I've been pouring into people since before we started our church, and now I'm working overtime to make sure that the entirety of my church is convicted in this way, and I'm going to preach it until they start waving the white flag. It's got to be second nature to us that when a person has become ripe for a decision to deliverance, that we have got to immediately include them and immediately involve them in conversation, in community, and in environments where we can more clearly assess why they are on the planet, more clearly identify what's after their lives, and be the more that's for them than that that is against them. 
the Bible says in the book of Acts that they continued in the apostles doctrine and the breaking of bread from house to house. That is the entire New Testament philosophy behind discipleship and mentoring and spiritual parenting and fathering. Paul had it. I had some 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 apostles try to justify why they didn't need covering and they didn't need to be uh, developed or accountable to anyone. But who is Paul accounted to? And, and here, you know, people really do need to read the Bible they preach. But Paul had several disciples, several teachers, several coaches throughout the duration of his apostleship. The only thing that was revealed to Paul firsthand that was controversial to the twelve was the mystery of grace. But he still submitted it to the Jerusalem council. The apostle James, which was his apostolic senior, uh, uh, he also had a time of upgrade through a married couple called Priscilla and Aquila. God also woke up a man by the name of Ananias when Paul was on his route to being transformed into apostolicity. And Ananias was sent from a whole different city and was sent to lay hands upon him to open up his eyes so that he could begin a new way. And God always will awaken somebody somewhere with resources in them to take you to your next level of clarity and your next level of visibility and your next level of information so the apostles in the book of acts when they continued house to house and when they continued breaking bread and fellowship they were doing what they knew to do jesus did this to them go into all nations and remind them of everything that i taught you to do we teach it like tell them everything i told you but no the bible says bring to their remembrance everything i taught you to do right and so the challenge is they were products of discipleship they were products of a man who was god and still made time to people now you got this bishop collar on you got consecrated and consummated and you can get these ashes on your forehead and you can got these ordination credentials and you don't have time.